Hi everyone, this is your intrepid reporter Rob Gray standing outside the Perception and Action Courthouse. Going on inside is the trial of the century. Monocular vision, aka Cyclops or One Eye, has accused binocular vision, aka Two Eyes or Stereo, of being completely irrelevant and unnecessary. This case will address the age-old question, why do we have two eyes? So it's time for a call to action. Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Let's move inside the courthouse for the case of monocular versus binocular vision. Order! Order in the court! Binocular vision, you have been accused of being unnecessary and irrelevant. How do you plead? I have two words, Your Honor. Depth perception. I mean, not guilty. We will now hear opening arguments. For the prosecution, monocular vision. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I would like you to try something completely reckless and dangerous. Don't worry, you're in a safe place. Place a hand over one of your eyes. Oh my lord, the world has collapsed into a horrible two-dimensional hell in which you are completely helpless to move around and pick up things. Or maybe actually nothing noticeable happened at all, did it? In this court case, the defense will talk to you about depth perception and throw fancy terms at you like stereopsis and binocular disparity. But I want you to think back to the demonstration you just did. People like me with only one eye get along in the world just fine. Sure, we might not be able to watch the next 3D Avengers movie, but is that really important in the grand scheme of things? In this case, the prosecution will show that binocular vision is completely unnecessary and is a waste of valuable processing resources within the brain. The only real benefit of having two eyes is so that one can act as a spare. Quiet in the court. Binocular vision, your opening statement. Bravo, my cyclopean friend. That was a colorful demonstration. Yes, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it is true that nothing dramatic seems to change when you cover up one eye, and you don't actually need two eyes to get around the world. However, I could easily do a demo of my own, this time having you try to thread a needle. In this court case, the defense will provide evidence that being able to combine information from our two eyes allows us to perform difficult actions with a high degree of precision. Binocular vision is like 3M. We don't allow you to perform actions, we allow you to perform them better. Okay, we've heard the opening arguments. It's now time for the prosecution to present its case. Monocular vision, call your first witness. Your Honor, the prosecution calls Sir Charles Wheatstone to the stand. <laughs> Sir Wheatstone, you have done a lot of work in this area and are an expert. Can you please explain stereopsis and binocular disparity to the court? Yes, happy to. To understand this, I want to compare the eyes of us humans to those of a rabbit. As you can see in this diagram, which is included in the show notes, the eyes of the rabbit are positioned on the side of its head, while our eyes are both in front. This is true in most of the animal kingdom. Predators like us, birds of prey, and large cats have eyes in front, while prey like rodents and small birds have eyes on the side. This creates two important differences. First, with eyes on the side, you get a much larger field of view. That is, you can see more without moving your head or eyes. A rabbit's field of view is nearly 360 degrees, so they can almost see all around them, which is extremely valuable when you're a prey animal that has to worry about being attacked all the time. Human beings and other predators with eyes in front, on the other hand, have a field of view less than 180 degrees. So essentially, we can only see things that are right in front of us. The second difference between these two types of visual systems is the amount of binocular overlap. 
That is, the amount of the world that we see with both eyes at the same time. With eyes in the front, this area is large. For humans, there is about a 120 degree area in the center of our visual field that is binocular. For example, if you hold out your thumb straight ahead of you and open and close each eye, you will notice that can be seen with both your left and right eye. Now, try moving your thumb as far left as you can so that you just see it when looking straight ahead. Now if you open and close your eyes, you will notice that it is only your left eye that is actually seeing your thumb. As humans, we have about a 30 to 40 degree monocular field on each side in our peripheral vision and the 120 degree binocular field in the center vision. The story is completely the opposite for animals with eyes on the side. For example, the rabbit has about a 20 degree binocular field directly in front of his head, then a large field of about 150 degrees on each side that is monocular. So, Sir Wheatstone, you might say that we've sacrificed the ability to see all around us at all times for a large binocular field in front of us. Is it really worth it? Well, we need to consider what this binocular overlap does for us. Take two objects, like a couple coffee cups, and place them on the desk in front of you, so that they are side by side, but with a small gap between them. Now open and close each eye while noticing the size of the gap. Nothing really changes, right? Now, keeping the size of the physical gap between them the same, move one of the cups further away, say about 30 centimeters or about one foot. Now do the same thing with your eyes. You should now notice a difference. The gap will be bigger with one eye open than with the other eye open. This is what we call a binocular disparity, a difference between the two eyes images. If you keep moving the far cup further and further away, this disparity will get bigger and bigger. Eventually, in one eye you will see the gap between the cups and the other eye you won't at all. And that is the key. Because they are separated on our head by about six and a half centimeters, our two eyes see the world slightly differently, creating this binocular disparity. And the size of this disparity is directly related to the relative depth of objects we're looking at. So if there's a large separation in depth, we get a big disparity. If there's a small depth separation between the objects, we get a small disparity. So binocular disparity gives us a powerful cue to depth perception. And the use of this cue is what we call stereopsis. Well, that was a lovely story, Sir Wheatstone, but I will refer back to the demo I did in my opening statement. When a person covers one eye, the world does not collapse into two dimensions. If binocular disparity is how we judge the depth of objects, how could this be? Well, binocular disparity is not the only depth information we have. There are several other cues to depth. Aha! Several! and many of them are monocular, aren't they? Yes, well, you can judge depth with one eye using interposition, height and plane, perspective, relative size. I will stop you there, Sir Wheatstone, lest we spend all day talking about the redundancies built into human depth reception. In fact, isn't it true that one of these monocular depth cues, motion parallax, which was discussed in episode 37 of the podcast, gives the exact same information as disparity? That is, if I closed one eye and just bobbed my head from side to side, I could do the exact same coffee cup demo with the gaps you just described. Yes, well, that is true. Isn't it also true, Sir Wheatstone, that some of the poor prey animals, like a pigeon, for example, without the benefit of this large binocular field, actually do learn to use this head bobbing technique? Well, yes. So, Sir Wheatstone, we've established this binocular disparity cue is completely redundant because we have lots of other cues. Now let's take a moment to compare these cues. Tell us, Sir Wheatstone, what if you did the same coffee cup demo again, but instead of placing the cups on the desk in front of you, they were on a table at the end of a long hallway. Would your wonderful demo still work? Well, no, it wouldn't. For a given depth separation between two objects, say the 30 centimeters between the two coffee cups in my demo, the binocular disparity created decreases with the square of the distance. So binocular disparity actually is only useful for objects that are closer than about 50 feet or so. So, Sir Wheatstone, we've sacrificed the ability to see all around us for a redundant piece of information that only works for nearby objects? 
And isn't it true, Sir Wheatstone, that all the work you did investigating binocular vision was solely for the purpose of making profits by providing a form of entertainment for the 19th century homes? If you please, tell the court about your stereoscope. Well, yes. Much like modern 3D movies you see in the theaters, my stereoscope worked by exploiting the flip side of the depth disparity relationship. If there is a depth separation between two objects, you get a binocular disparity. So, if you can artificially create disparity between the two eyes images, whether it be with the lenses in my stereoscope or the glasses at a 3D movie, people will see depth. Objects will appear to jump out of the screen or photograph. But that was not my only motivation. No more question for the witness, your honor. <coughs> Binocular vision, would the defense like to cross-examine this witness? Yes, we would, your honor. Sir Wheatstone, how well do these other wonderful monocular depth cues work when the objects you're looking at are very small, like the needle and thread I mentioned in my opening statement? Not very well. Cues like interposition and relative size would be pretty ineffective. And tell me, Sir Wheatstone, if the object we are looking at is moving very quickly, say trying to catch a deflected cricket ball from behind the wicket, would there be enough time to bob my head back and forth and use motion parallax? No, I don't think so. So in other words, Sir Wheatstone, you're saying that binocular disparity is not a completely redundant depth cue because there are some situations where the other cues might not be very effective. True? Yes. No more questions for this witness, Your Honor. Okay. Will the prosecution call their next witness? Your Honor, the prosecution calls Mr. Wiley Post to the stand. Mr. Post, you are a famous aviator. Can you tell us when your career began? Yes, it was 1924 when I was 26 years old. I was a parachutist in a flying circus for a few years for Burl Tibbs and his top-notch Texas Flyers. Can you tell us, Mr. Post, what happened on October 1st, 1926? Yes, I was working as part of the crew on an oil rig and there was an explosion. I ended up losing my left eye. So, Mr. Post, you lost the magical power of binocular vision and stereopsis. Surely this must have put an end to your aviation career. Heck no, I used the money from the accident settlement to buy my first plane, Winnie Mae. I then went on to win that National Air Race Derby from L.A. to Chicago in 1930. Also, Mr. Post, you then went on to do something pretty spectacular that same year. Yes, my navigator Harold Gaddy and I set the record for flying around the world. 15,474 miles in 8 days and 15 hours. Well, surely the success of this endeavor must have been due to the fact your navigator still had two eyes and normal binocular vision. Heck no. Actually, three years later, I broke the around-the-world record flying solo. So, Mr. Post, in your opinion, the incredibly visually demanding task that is flying a plane, see episode 31 of the podcast, does not require binocular vision. No. No, it doesn't. And it's not just me. In sports, Indian cricket legend Mansur Ali Khan Patati was a highly successful batter even after he lost the use of his right eye. On the research side, in 1991, McKnight and colleagues found no differences in terms of driving safety and accident rates for monocular versus binocular heavy truck drivers. That's interesting, Mr. Post. But what if we move away from these complex tasks and look at a normal everyday life? Surely losing an eye must have some consequences for that. No, even in terms of normal everyday life, you're hard-pressed to find any major differences between people with two normal working eyes and those that have lost one, which are called anuculates. To quote from a 2008 review article by Jennifer Steve, Esther Gonzalez, and Marty Steinbach, quote, Practically speaking, one-eyed individuals maintain perfectly normal lives and are not limited by their lack of binocularity. End quote. Excellent, Mr. Post. So binocular vision isn't necessary. But if we do have it, surely people with greater sensitivity to it must show some benefits in terms of performing actions. For example, going back to aviation, 
What if we look at pilots that have working binocular vision? The ones that score better on a test of their ability to use binocular disparity to judge depth, a test called stereoacuity, surely they must be better pilots. No, no. In a 1993 study, Snyder and Lazat looked at the stereoacuity test pilots received at the start of flight school. There was no significant relationship between stereoacuity and whether or not they passed training. So, Mr. Post, in a nutshell, we don't need binocular vision to perform actions, be it making ourselves dinner or flying around the world solo. No more questions for this witness, Your Honor. <coughs> binocular vision? Would the defense like to cross-examine the witness? Yes, Your Honor. I enjoyed hearing all your examples, Mr. Post. But tell me, have you heard of Colin Milburn or Tony Canigliero? No, no, I haven't. Well, Mr. Post, they're both examples of athletes, one in cricket and one in baseball, who were never as good and eventually had to retire after losing one eye. So like with most things, if I selectively pick examples, I can find both people who are adapted to life without binocular vision and those that haven't. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there are examples of people that continue being athletes after leg amputations. That doesn't mean there aren't benefits to having two legs. No more questions for this witness, Your Honor. Okay, would the prosecution call their next witness? Your Honor, the prosecution calls its final witness, Dr. Alfred Bilichowski, to the stand. Doctor, can you please explain to the court what fusion is? Yes, as has already been established, our eyes see the world from slightly different views. But what we don't want is to see both of these views at the same time. If we do, we get double vision, or what is called diplopia. In order to prevent this, we need to fuse the images together into one image. Doctor, what are some conditions that might cause double vision? It's actually quite common to experience. Many people might have noticed it when they've had a few too many drinks at the bar. But it can also result from prescription drugs, other eye disorders like strabismus, diabetes, cancer, migraine headaches, and even traumatic brain injury. I actually discovered a case of it that resulted from spasms in the eye muscles. I called it horror fusiononis, or fear of fusion. And tell me, doctor, would having long-term diplopia resulting from one of these conditions just be a minor annoyance? No, no, no. It can be extremely debilitating, resulting in things like vertigo and nausea. So, you're saying as a trade-off for this redundant death cue, we create the possibility of this horrific lack of fusion that has multiple possible causes. Wonderful. No more questions for this witness, Your Honor. <coughs> Binocular vision? Would the defense like to cross-examine this witness? Yes, Your Honor. Tell me, Dr. Bielachowski, what is the incidence of diplopia and can it be treated? Yes, well, it only makes up about 1% of the cases eye specialists see and there are actually a few different treatments depending on the cause. These include wearing an eye patch, wearing special lenses with a prism, surgery, and even just using eye exercises. No more questions for this witness, Your Honor. <coughs> okay, prosecution, do you have any more witnesses? No, the prosecution rests, Your Honor. Okay, would the defense call their first witness? Your Honor, the defense calls J.J. Gibson to the stand. Dr. Gibson, Throughout this trial, my esteemed opponent has attacked binocular disparity and stereopsis as being irrelevant. But that's not all binocular vision gives us, is it? No. Almost everybody focuses on the fact that our two eyes give slightly different views of the world. But it's equally important when they tell us the same thing. As I wrote in 1966, quote, Frontal vision with two eyes can be useful merely as two hands are useful in touching things they yield an extra input of the same information, a redundancy of input which helps perception, end quote. This binocular concordance gives us extra information about the world around us. 
in the same manner we get when we look at something once and then again to confirm a perception, like when we cross the street, for example. So binocular vision is not all about being able to judge the depth of objects. Two is just better than one in most cases. Dr. Gibson, is there any evidence which shows that this is important for, say, the control of action? Yes, in 1981, Rebecca Jones and David Lee conducted a study in which they looked at the performance of several basic tasks. For most of these, they attempted to reduce the importance of stereopsis and depth perception, for example, by having participants watch what they're doing on a closed-circuit TV. They looked at tasks including threading a needle, pouring water into a narrow neck vessel, reaching for targets, and control a stance. In all cases, performance was significantly better with two eyes open as compared to when one eye was closed. Another very good study showing the importance of binocular vision was conducted by Salvesberg and Whiting in 1992. In this study, they compared one-headed catching ability under monocular and binocular viewing conditions for expert ball players. There were significantly more spatial errors, in other words, the hand was in the wrong place, under monocular viewing. A nice follow-up to this was conducted by Mazin and colleagues in 2004. They compared the one-handed catching ability of people with normal stereo vision and weak stereo vision, as measured by a stereo acuity test. For the weak stereo group, there is no significant difference between catching performance with one eye open and with both eyes open. And the performance got worse and worse as the ball speed increased, dropping from about 90% successful catches for the slowest speed to only about 50% for the fastest. For participants with normal stereopsis, performance was always significantly better under binocular viewing and it didn't fall off nearly as much due to speed, dropping from 95% to only 83% as speed was increased. So, Dr. Gibson, one way of summing this up might be to say that if you want to just have adequate performance, say catching 75% of balls that are traveling slow, or to reach to pick up a big object that doesn't require very precise hand movements, then monocular vision is good enough. But if you want to successfully perform actions that have a high degree of spatial and temporal precision, like catching a fast-moving ball or performing surgery, you need binocular vision. And the value of this binocular vision is not all due to depth perception from binocular disparity, is it, Dr. Gibson? Yes, that is correct. Another situation where binocular vision seems to be required is when you need to deal with a lot of obstacles or clutter in the environment. As is nicely demonstrated in the 3D multiple object tracking test that is part of the neural tracker training system, see episode 21C, when there is a lot of clutter, binocular vision helps you pick out the forest from the trees, so to speak. For example, there is anecdotal evidence that drivers with only one eye have trouble in dealing with crowded streets. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. No more questions for this witness, Your Honor. Monocular vision, would the prosecution like to cross-examine this witness? Yes, Your Honor. Tell me, Dr. Gibson, are you familiar with the specificity of practice principle? Yes, it is the idea that people perform best under the precise conditions they were trained under. And, Dr. Gibson, isn't it true that most of us have been trained under conditions of binocular vision all of our lives? So we should be best when viewing binocularly. Can you please tell the court what happened in the Salvesburg and Whiting 1992 study when they attempted to train poor catchers under conditions of monocular viewing? Well, with practice they got so they could catch equally well in monocular and binocular conditions. And tell me, Dr. Gibson, in the Jones and Lee 1981 study, were participants allowed to bob their heads so they could use motion parallax? And Dr. Gibson, what happens to reaching ability when participants are encouraged to do head bobbing under monocular conditions? Well, in the Jones study, you're right, head bobbing wasn't used. In terms of using head bobbing, yes, for example, in a 1995 study by Murata and colleagues, it was shown that enucleated individuals do seem to learn head movement strategies to compensate for a lack of binocular vision when picking up objects. So, in other words, Dr. Gibson, a large part of the advantage of binocular vision for the control of actions is that we've had a lot of practice using it. If we were given more practice using monocular vision, we would likely develop different strategies, for example, moving our head more, and become just as good at performing these actions. No more questions for this witness, Your Honor.
Okay, defense call your next witness. The defense calls Dr. Bella Ulesh to the stand. Dr. Ulesh, in this trial so far we've been focusing on acting on objects, picking them up, catching them, driving around them, etc. Isn't it true that sometimes we need binocular vision to see the objects are there in the first place? Yes, binocular disparity is not just a cue to depth. It's actually a powerful source of information which allows us to segregate an object or figure from its background. I demonstrated this with the invention of my random dot stereogram in the early 70s. Most people know this now as one of those magic eye posters with lots of dots, where something pops out if you stare at it long enough. See the show notes for an example. What is going on here is that some of the dots in the image are slightly shifted relative to the others. So if you look in just the correct place, you create a binocular disparity, making part of the image appear to be at a different depth. That's interesting, Dr. Ulesh. What does this random dot stereogram tell us that we wouldn't learn from other types of 3D images? Like say the ones we get at movies now or with the red green glasses. Well, the key point about my stereograms is that they have no other visual cues in them, like brightness or color. The image is only visible through the use of binocular disparity. Dr. Ulesh, what have you shown using this? Well, by presenting stimulus this way, we are able to do what I call psychophysical dissection of the visual pathways in the brain. That is, we can send information to your eyes that only the parts of the brain that process binocular visual information will be able to see. We have essentially cut out all the monocular areas of your brain temporarily. Doing this, we have found that a very large proportion of our brain seems to have binocular neurons. They can be found in LGN, in parts of the visual cortex like V1, V2, V4, and V5. Basically, a large part of our brain seems to be involved in combining the images from our two eyes. So it must be important. Thank you, Dr. Ulesh. No more questions for this witness, Your Honor. <coughs> Monocular vision. Would the prosecution like to cross-examine this witness? Yes, Your Honor. Dr. Ulesh. You say that in your random dot stereograms, all other visual cues to figure ground segregation are removed. How often would it be the case in the real world that binocular disparity would be the only cue available? Well, it's actually pretty rare. Mostly just when you have very small objects, like a pilot trying to see a telephone line or the threading a needle example. So Dr. Ulesh, again, in most cases we have redundancy. In terms of binocular neurons in the brain, isn't it the case that what our neurons respond to is in a large part shaped by our environment? And if we had not had experienced binocular vision during our development, we would likely have some different arrangement in our brain. No more questions for this witness, Your Honor. Okay, will the defense call their next witness? The defense calls its last witness, Dr. Oliver Sacks. Dr. Sacks, can you please tell us the story of your patient known as Stereo Sue? Yes, Sue is a neuroscience and professor that was born in 1954. As a result of being cross-eyed since early infancy, she did not have functional stereo vision. That is, her brain could not combine the images from her two eyes. This was true for most of her life. It wasn't until she had vision therapy in her 40s that at the age of 48, this became possible. What happened then, Dr. Sachs? Amazingly, even though she missed what we thought was the critical period for developing binocular neurons in the brain, she developed stereopsis in her mid-40s. As she put it, ordinary things looked extraordinary. Light fixtures floated and water faucets stuck way out in space. Dr. Sachs, was she a unique, isolated case? No, after the initial article I wrote about her was published in the New York Times, she was contacted by dozens of people who had a similar experience of suddenly getting 3D stereo experiences later in their life. So Dr. Sachs, in a nutshell, us having stereo vision does not seem to be solely due to what we experience at an early age. And even more importantly, having it, adds a richness to our visual experience we don't get otherwise. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. No more questions for this witness, Your Honor. <coughs> Monocular vision, would the prosecution like to cross-examine the witness? Yes, Your Honor. 
Dr. Sachs, was Stereo Sue struggling in her life before she had this revelation? Was she homebound and helpless? No, she could do almost anything for most of her life and was happily ignorant about binocular vision. No more questions for this witness, Your Honor. Do you have any more witnesses to call binocular vision? No, the defense rests, Your Honor. It's time now for closing statements. For the prosecution, monocular vision. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, today the prosecution has demonstrated that binocular vision provides redundant information that is highly limited, for example by viewing distance, and this comes at a cost of reduced visual field size and the potential for double vision. And it's not necessary for the successful performance of most motor actions. It's estimated that roughly 5-10% to of people do not have stereo vision and they get along just fine. And there are individual cases of athletes, pilots and other performers who have excelled without two eyes. The superiority of binocular vision and the large number of neurons we seem to have in our brain devoted to it seems to be just a consequence of having lots of experience with it. If we had some other arrangement of our eyes, for example one on each side of our head or one big one in the middle of our head, we would have likely developed a completely different but equally effective visual system. This has led vision scientists to make conclusions like, quote, the sole purpose of having two eyes is so that one can act as a spare, end quote. And quote, two eyes are better than one but not by very much, end quote. For these reasons, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you must find binocular vision guilty of being unnecessary. <laughs> Thank you, binocular vision. And for the defense, binocular vision. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, today the defense has demonstrated that binocular vision provides several important advantages over and above what we get from monocular vision. Not only does it provide depth information for binocular disparity, it can also provide a corresponding second view of what we see, and is important for being able to distinguish objects from their background. And it just adds richness to our visual lives, making things pop out. Living without it, in many ways must be similar to seeing things always in black and white. In terms of research and case studies concerning how well we perform actions with monocular and binocular viewing, this has been a large part inconclusive. For every example of an athlete who has excelled with one eye, we can find another whose career ended due to an eye injury. And research has clearly shown that in some cases, like when threading a needle or catching a fast moving ball with one hand, binocularity is clearly superior. The idea that we'd be just as good drivers, athletes, and pilots if we had been born with a different type of visual system that didn't emphasize binocularity is interesting, but it's pure speculation. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, even if you don't see a clear purpose for binocular vision, you must still have a doubt about its role and find it not guilty. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what is your decision? Court adjourned. I hope you enjoy this little bit of legal drama. Coming soon from the Perception and Action Court, the case of low versus high variability. As always, you can contact me via email, robgray at asu.edu, follow me on Twitter at shakyweights, and find all the information about this podcast at perceptionaction.com. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now. <laughs> <laughs>